بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا وقدوتنا وقائدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and peace be upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I testify that there is no God except Allah and I testify that Muhammad is the Prophet and the Messenger of Allah my brothers and sisters in Islam I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making us from amongst those who get together for the sake of Allah to please Allah and to learn more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the more that you learn about Allah azza wa jal the closer you become to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the more you learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the more you love Allah azza wa jal and the more you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the more that you fear Allah and fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the pathway for you to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst those who love Allah get closer to Allah and fear Allah azza wa jal as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention in the holy Quran in surah al-Baqarah and the garment and the cloth of taqwa, it is the greatest thing. The garment and the cloth of taqwa is the greatest thing. Insha'Allah, tonight we will start a new chapter in the book of Riyadh al-Salihin, which is a very important chapter for us as Muslims, which is the chapter of manners, al-akhlaq, kitab al-adab, kitab al-adab, the book of manners. And Islam is about manners. Islam is about akhlaq. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speaks about himself and he says, Bu'ithtu l'utammima makarim al-akhlaq. I was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to complete and perfect the noble manners. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's mission as the Prophet and the Messenger of Allah is to convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to complete and complement your good manners. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had shown me all the good deeds and the bad deeds. And he says, alayhi salatu wa salam, I did not find anything that's more heavier on the scale than the good manners. Good manners. Subhanallah, something that we neglect, unfortunately. A lot of people forsake and forget about the importance of manners. We focus on a lot of good things. But this is also one important thing that we need to focus on. We focus on the salah, which is good. We focus on the Siyam, which is good. We focus on the Quran again, which is important. But there's also something that you need to add to it, which is equal important, if not more important than some of those things that sometimes we focus on, which is good manners. Having good manners. So inshallah, next few Thursdays, we'll be talking about different aspects and different matters pertaining to good manners so we'll be talking about different traits and different qualities different attributes that we need to possess as muslims when it comes to good manners the first chapter that imam and now we had uh, started with it is the chapter of modesty so the first thing that he started with manners is modesty and the first hadith that imam and now we had started by compiling and adding to this chapter which is the chapter of modesty is this hadith that's been narrated by Ibn Umar in which he says وعن Ibn Umar رضي الله تعالى عنهما أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم مر على رجل من الأنصار وهو يعظ أخاه في الحياء فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم دعه فإن الحياء من الإيمان متفق عليه So this hadith that's been narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab رضي الله تعالى عنهما in which he says that the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم went past a man from the people of Ansar. Who are the Ansar? Are the original residents of Medina. So when the Prophet Muhammad migrated from Mecca to Medina, the migrants who migrated from Mecca to Medina, the Muslims, the Sahaba who migrated with the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, from Mecca to Medina were called Al Muhajirun, migrants. And the original residents of Medina, they were called Al Ansar, the helpers or supporters. So the Ansar. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, gets past a man from the people of Ansar. He was admonishing and another narration might be translated to he was given an advice to his brother about modesty. Now the scholars have different sayings and interpretation to this hadith or explanation to this hadith. Some of them were saying that he was given advice to his brother about being too modest and he was admonishing him. You know, sometimes you might say to someone, you're too shy, toughen up. Maybe this sahabi was talking to his brother in this way. So when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, saw that companion speaking to his brother about modesty, and Nabi وسلم, said to him, Da'hu, leave him alone. فَإِنَّ الْحَيَاءَ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ 
Modesty is from the Iman. Shyness is from Iman. Being shy is part of Iman, is a reflection of your Iman. It doesn't mean that when, when you are shy, it means that you are shy from everything. See, the thing is, you always have those two qualities, but you need to balance them. You need to be strong, at the same time shy. You need to be modest, but at the same time brave. And Nabi Sallallahu was very modest. And Nabi Sallallahu was very shy. And that's why you find in the next hadith that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was described to be more shy than a virgin woman behind the veil. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi used to be more shy than a virgin woman. But he was brave at the same time. He was shy alayhi salatu was salam. He was modest alayhi salatu was salam. He was more shy than a virgin woman. But at the same time, he was brave sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Sahaba will say, when he used to get so heated in the battlefield, when things used to escalate on the battlefield, we used to go and hide behind the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We used to shield ourselves behind the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is modest. And he's shy alayhi salatu wa sallam. More modest than anyone else, more shy than anyone else, including a virgin woman. But at the same time, he was brave and courageous, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You'll encounter and find people are so modest and shy to the extent that you can't even talk to them anymore. Assalamu alaikum, alaikum as salam, and they just get too, get too shy. And you find people are so abrupt to the extent that you can't even talk to them. You feel intimidated by talking to them. You need to balance that. You need to be shy and brave. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the shyest and the most modest when shyness is needed. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the bravest when bravery was needed. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in this hadith, فَإِنَّ الْحَيَاءَ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ That shyness and modesty is part of Iman. When someone is modest, when someone is shy, that's a reflection of their Iman. You don't want someone that's abrupt, says whatever they want, they talk however they want. You know, some people have no shyness at all. They just say whatever they want. They talk however they want. Subhanallah, today we we're talking about fiqh, and we spoke about some issues, and I was saying to the brothers and sisters, the students in Sydney Islamic College Year 3, advanced classes, I was saying to them that it's haram for a husband to share some of his intimacy or sexual relationship with his wife to other people or for a wife a woman to share her sexual relationship with her husband to other people people do that the reason they do that is because there's no modesty there's no shyness he's willing to talk about his sexual activity with his wife to other people she's willing to talk about what happens between her and her husband to other people and nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam spoke against this but the reason that someone will do that is because there's no shyness in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in one hadith, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاسْنَعْ مَا شِئْتْ If you are not shy, if you are not modest, then do whatever you want to do. The only reason that people have the courage to step beyond their boundaries and to do the haram because there's no modesty, there's no shyness. That's why they, st they step the limits. That's why they step the limits. That's, the, that's why they go beyond the limits. That's why the cross, the red line, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاسْنَعْ مَا شِئْتْ That's why the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, if you are not shy, then do whatever you want. The only reason that people do what they're doing is because there's no shyness. The only reason that people do unacceptable things in the public or even amongst close circle of people because they're not shy. The only reason that people fall in the haram because there's no shyness. And you've got two types of people. Some people commit, in the, commit the haram in a closed environment and other people commit haram in an open environment. Now obviously committing haram is haram. And it's evil. And it's wrong regardless whether it's in a closed environment or open environment. But what makes it worse is when you do it in an open environment. What makes it worse? When you do it in an open environment. To commit the haram, to, to commit the evil act, the evil action. There's no shyness. There's no modesty. People are not respecting, people are not respecting the privacy of other people because there's no shyness. People are infringing on other people's privacy because there's no shyness. 
People are becoming so nosy because there's no shyness. People are interfering with other people's privacy because there's no shyness. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Either lam tastahi, fasna ma shit. If you are not shy, then what stops you from doing whatever you want? The only thing that stops people from doing the haram after the piety, after their righteousness, after fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is modesty. Modesty stops people from committing the haram. And that's why modesty is a quality that we need to preserve. Modesty is an attribute that we need to protect. And that's why when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went past that companion that was talking to another companion about modesty, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, leave him alone, modesty is part of Iman. And when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that modesty and shyness is part of Iman, which means the more shyness, the more modesty, the more shy and modest you are, the more Iman you have. If it's in its place, again, sometimes too much of uh, one thing will have the counterproductive effect on you will have the counterproductive effect on you no you need to be balanced you need to be shy when shyness is needed and you need to be brave when bravery is needed and that's the character of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was alayhi salatu wasallam so shy sallallahu alaihi wasallam so shy more shy than a virgin woman but when it came to bravery sallallahu alaihi was brave he was the bravest sallallahu alaihi wasallam when it came to courage Alayhi salatu wa sallam was courageous, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So much so that the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum narrate that once in the middle of the night they heard a big bang. So everyone got together, everyone was waiting for another person to wake up and until they assembled a group of people and then they walked out to check out what was that big bang. So while they're walking towards that noise or to that sound that they've heard, they heard someone coming from that side. So who was it? It was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu on his own. He didn't wait for anyone to come with him. And Nabi Sallallahu went on his own, checked it out and came back. He was brave Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was courageous Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when it came to modesty and shyness, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was very shy. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also says, Al-Hayā'u la yati illa bi khayr. Modesty and shyness only brings goodness. Modesty and shyness only brings goodness. In another narration, Al-Hayā'u Khayrun Kulluhu That modesty is goodness, is all goodness. That's the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That modesty and shyness brings goodness. This khair out of it. This goodness out of it. When you get married to someone who has and possesses shyness and goodness, you are getting married to someone that has that goodness. You get married to someone that possesses shyness, and modesty, you are getting married to someone that has that goodness. And everyone is looking for a spouse that's good. Then one of the characteristics that you should be looking into someone that you want to have as your wife or your husband, then look into someone that's shy. Look into someone that's modest. Then you look for someone that's abrupt. You know, it's like, you know, a gangster. You're talking to him or her, it's like a gangster. Toughy. No shyness. Talk, you know, like they talk whenever they want and this and that. See, sometimes let's not mix between a strong character and shyness. It doesn't mean that if you have a strong character, it doesn't mean you're not shy. Now you have to have shyness. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi had the strongest character. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi had the strong personality, but he was shy at the same time. You should be looking for someone with a strong character. But part of being a strong character is this person knows how to balance. He knows how to balance out when to be shy, when to be modest. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Al-Hayā'u la yāti illā bi khayr. Shyness and modesty only brings goodness. Go and look for someone that has shyness. In bed, shyness in your kids, modesty in your kids. SubhanAllah, sometimes you see some people, the way they bring up their kids and the way they raise their kids, they bring them up in a way where they want their kids to be abrupt, to be rude. Ah, oh, you know what, son, I say that word. Swear at this person. You should be teaching your kids to be shy and modest. Especially when it comes to elderly people, when it comes to senior people. Unfortunately, we live in a time and era where people want to teach their kids to be abrupt and rude. And they push their kids to be abrupt and rude. They encourage their kids to be rude to oldies. Encourage their kids to be rude to elderly people. They encourage their kids to be rude to other people. That's wrong. You need to be teaching your kids modesty. 
If you want goodness in your kid's life, then teach him modesty, as the Prophet Muhammad says. Modesty only brings goodness to you. In bed, in the lives, in the personality, in the character of your kids, modesty. If you see your kids saying something out of line, out of line teach them a good lesson. You see your kids saying something out of line, you see your kids say, saying something which is wrong, teach them a good lesson. Then uh, pride yourself with your kids being abrupt and being rude and take that to be, my, my son is tough. No, he's not tough, he's rude. I've seen it, wallahi. I've seen a father once who was saying to his son, oh, say that if word, say that. And his son is only four or five years old. And every time the son will say that, oh, he laughs, oh, look at my son, oh, he's tough, he's a thug. Oh, he's a thug because his father is a thug. Your son is not tough, your son is rude. Don't take pride in your son being rude. And tomorrow, the way you're teaching your son to say the F word or to say those words, let us see what's going to happen tomorrow when he grows up, what's he going to do to you? He'll be the first person to attack is you. The first person to swear is you. The first person to abuse is you. The first person to insult is you. Because you're the one that taught him to be that. Al-haya la yati illa bi khair. We need to teach our children to be modest. We need to teach our children to be shy. And when we talk about modesty, not only in character, even in clothing. Because your clothing reflects upon your modesty. Your clothing reflects upon your modesty. So we need to be modest when it comes to our clothing. And that's why the Sharia is very strict when it comes to covering the awrah. The private part. And when we say the private part from an Islamic perspective. And the private part of a man is from the belly button to the knees. And a woman, all of her except the face and the hands up to the wrist. There's got to be some modesty here when it comes to clothes. We shouldn't be teaching our children from a young age for them to be wearing whatever they want to be wearing, whether a boy or a girl. And we should also be modest when it comes to our clothing. Your clothing is a reflection of your modesty. And that's why our women, our sisters, our Muslim women wear the hijab as a sign of modesty. It's a reflection of modesty. Islam ordains upon Muslim female, Muslim women for them to be wearing the hijab because that's a sign of modesty. Islam ordains upon men for them to be covered also, not for them to be wearing whatever they want to be wearing as a sign of modesty. So your clothing is a reflection of your modesty. Your character is a reflection of your modesty. Your actions, your behavior is a reflection of your modesty. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam encourages modesty. And he says it only bring khair. Modesty will only bring khair, goodness. You want goodness? Then be modest. You want khair? Be modest. In the following hadith, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also says, Al-Imanu bid'un wa sab'una aw bid'un wa sittuna shu'ba. Fa afdaluha qawlu la ilaha illa Allah. Wa adnaha imatatu al-adha an al-tariq. Wa al-hayau shu'batun min al-Iman. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Iman is divided into a number of Categories. Bid'un means like, could, uh, 72, 73, 74. So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, says that Iman is divided into over 70 categories. Into over 70 or odds, 70 odd branches. Iman is divided into 70 odd branches. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, says the best of the branches of Iman is to say La ilaha illallah. That's the heaviest. The heaviest. The heaviest branch of Iman and the heaviest part of Iman or portion of Iman is to say La ilaha illallah. In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in many different hadith that if the heavens and the earth and everything that's surrounding them and between them were to put on one part of the scale La ilaha illallah or another part of the scale La ilaha illallah will be more heavier than the entire seven heavens put together and the earth and everything around it. So la ilaha illallah is the heaviest portion and the heaviest branch of iman. Then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says, and the lowest branch of iman is that you remove a harmful object from the path or from the road. So when you are walking and you see something which is harmful on the road or on the pathway or on the street, you remove it. That's part of iman. 
That's part of Iman, that's part of a reflection of the Iman that you contain in your heart and you possess in your heart. When you're walking on the street, walking in the park and you see something which is harmful, you see a breaking glass or you see something that people will walk or step on, they'll slip or will harm people. Part of your Iman, when you look at it, you grab it and you remove it, put it aside for example, at least put it in a bin. That's when you start measuring your Iman. You are walking in the park or you're walking on the street and you see something which is a harmful object. Now you could measure your Iman. If you come out of your way and you remove this harmful object, put it aside or throw it in the bin, then that's a reflection of your Iman. But if you're just going to look at it and say, you know what, why should it be me? Then I'm sorry to say to you, that's a sign of weakness of your Iman. So my brother and my sister, next time when you're walking on the street or wherever you are, you see a harmful object, remove it, throw it. Prevent that harm. That's a reflection of your Iman. Then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu furthermore says, وَالْحَيَاءُ شُعْبَةٌ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ And modesty and shyness is also a branch from the 70 odd branches of Iman. وَالْحَيَاءُ شُعْبَةٌ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ Modesty is also a branch from the 70 odd branches of Iman. That's a thermometer, a measurement that you can measure your Iman. Look at yourself, how shy you are, how modest you are. That's a reflection of your Iman. As I mentioned, also a reflection of Iman when you see a harmful ob object on the street and you remove it. Subhanallah, sometimes you see it here in the center, people see the rubbish, oh, there's a rubbish over there, and they just walk over it. Pick it up. For the sake of Allah, do it. Wallahi, I take it as a sign of honor. That subhanallah, sometimes I'm coming to the center, I'm coming to the masjid, and then I'll see a piece of rubbish. I say, subhanallah, ya Allah, you even want to give me more hasanat before I even enter the masjid for me to pick up something from your house or to pick up something from the center for your sake. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'll look at it this way. I'm not going to look, look at it as a degrading thing where, you know what, I'm a sheikh, I'm not going to pick it up. Oh, I have full of cleaner, come and cleaner. That's an honor. Maybe Allah is just giving me this opportunity for me to clean something out of his house for me to get more rewards. So rather than me getting a number of rewards because of the prayers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also wants to give me an extra additional reward because I picked up something from the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or from the center which is an Islamic center that resembles something about Islam and it is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says that Iman is 70 odd branches. One of those branches is al haya modesty, shyness, to be shy, to be modest, is a reflection of your Iman. To be abrupt, to be loud, to think, Wallahi, you could put it over everyone and you're not shy at all. And you know, these days, subhanAllah, we've turned everything around. What's good is bad and what's bad is good. Exactly what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi had warned of 1,400 years ago. What did he say, alayhi salatu was salam? It'll come a time where good will be bad and bad will be good. Evilness will be something that people will look up to and something good people will turn away from it. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that there will come a time where people just flip things. Good will be bad and bad will be good. And right now when people are loud and abrupt, people look up to him. He's hectic. Someone who's a thug, oh, you know what, I want to become like him. A criminal, I want to become like him. Someone who prays, oh, he's a nerd. Studies, oh, look at this nerd. Teaches per. Subhanallah. If someone studies and graduates and is successful in his uh, career and education, he's a nerd. If someone is a thug, a criminal, a gangster, Allah, he's hectic. Allah, I want to become like him. If someone is modest, this guy, he's too shy. If someone is loud and abrupt, oh, you know what? He's the type of person that I would like to hang out with. Exactly what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said. There will come a time where good will be bad, bad will be good. We need to be choosing the right people for ourselves. Whether it's a spouse, whether it's a husband or wife, whether it's our children, we have to make sure they have modesty and shyness, whether it's our friends, we should be looking and selecting the right people they want to hang out with and choose someone who is modest and shy. As the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, mentions this hadith, that modesty and shyness is a branch from the Iman. A branch from the Iman. And the final hadith here in this uh, chapter is uh, what I mentioned to you before as uh, Sa Abi Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa used to be a lot more shyer than a virgin behind her veil. Subhanallah. 
That's the character of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the balance, I just want you to look at a balance. The balance that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to have between shyness and bravery. So brave alayhi salatu wasallam, so shy at the same time. And one of the people that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commended for his shyness is Uthman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala an. Whilst the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in his house, in the presence of his wives, and one of them is Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting down and was playing with his thigh. So his thigh was uncovered. And some of the scholars say it was his thigh that's above his knee. And also you can say thigh, fakhid in Arabic, to your calf. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is there and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had his thigh uncovered. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu enters the house of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not change his tape. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu enters and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not change his tape. Until Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu enters the house of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam covers his thigh. Later on, his wife alayhi salatu was salam. Aisha will ask the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the question, O oh, Messenger of Allah, Abu Bakr walked in and he didn't cover his thigh. Then Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu walks in. You didn't cover your thigh. Then when Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu walked in, you covered your thigh. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ala astahi mimman tastahi minhu al-malaika. Shouldn't I be shy from someone that the angels are shy from? That's Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was a shy person, a modest person. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam complimented and praised because of his shyness. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even reacted when Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu entered the house of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, but the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam covering his thigh, whilst the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't do that when Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhum entered the house of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam. Ala astahi mimman tastahi minum malaika. He was a man that the angels are shy from him. Should I not be shy from him? That's Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't cover his thigh for. But then when it came to Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam covered his thigh. Which brings us to the second topic tonight. And that's guarding secrets. And guarding secrets is a reflection of shyness too. When someone entrusts you with a secret, you must uphold that trust. Safeguard that trust. If I tell you a secret and I tell you, look, look just keep this between him and you. I'll tell you a secret and I'll tell you, look, just keep this between him and you. Don't share it with anyone. Okay? You must respect my request. Whether we are together, we have a fallout. You know, these days you've got a lot of people, okay, I'll keep your secret as long as you and I are on good terms. But the moment we have a fallout, you, you'll see what I'm going to do. I'm going to publicize your secret to the entire world. And unfortunately, it happens a lot between husband and wife. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَوْفُوا بِالْعَهْدِ إِنَّ الْعَهْدَ كَانَ مَسْؤُولَ فَنْفُوا Your vows and promises. Your promise will be questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in hereafter. When someone entrusts you over something, you must fulfill that trust. Otherwise, just tell this person, look, I'm not going to fulfill this trust. Then. If, if, then ask me to keep a secret, then tell me a secret. Because if you're going to tell me a secret, I'm not the type of person that can safeguard and protect a secret. If you are that type of person, then disclose that to someone who's coming to tell you a secret. The first hadith here, the Prophet Muhammad says, Inna min ashari nasi inda Allahi manzilatan yawm al qiyam, al rajulu yufdi ila al mar'a, wa tufdi ilayhi thumma yanshuru sirraha. The Prophet Muhammad says, The worst of people, the most evil of people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter, is when a man discloses his secret to his wife, and a wife discloses her secret to her husband. And then later on, they go and disclose their secrets to other people and publicize it to other people. And it happens a lot, subhanAllah, especially between husband and wife, when they break off. As long as we are together, don't worry. Your secret is safeguarded. But we look, you'll see what's going to happen the moment we break off. As long as we're together, your secret is in a safe place. But the moment we break off, well, all your secrets on the top of it, I'm going to even make it even worse. And I'll publicize all your secrets to everyone else. That's haram. Not only haram, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu says it is one of the worst of evilness. One of the worst of actions. In which the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu says they are from the worst of people in the sight of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Whether it's husband and wife, or between friends, for example, brothers. Akhi, I wanna 
tell you the secret, keep it between us. And alhamdulillah, because you and I are on good terms, alhamdulillah, the secret is safeguarded. The secret is taken care of. It's in the deep ocean. But the moment they have that fallout, straight away, you go out and expose this person and publicize it and tell the entire world about this person and that person. Oh, you know what? He entrusted me with the secret. You know, he's this and he's that. That's haram. And not only haram, it's one of the worst of harams. One of the most evil actions that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had warned of. If someone entrusts you with a secret, you must safeguard that secret. Regardless if you are on good terms with this person or bad terms. Whether it's a husband or wife, or they break it off. You must safeguard that secret. One of the worst of people, as the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, makes mention, is when a husband discloses a secret to his wife, and the wife discloses a secret to her husband, and then later on, they go and publicize it to other people. My brother and my sister, if someone entrusts you with a secret, regardless how good you are with this person, or bad you are with this person, you never ever disclose or publicize that secret. Even if this person turns out to be your worst of enemies. That's it. Stays there. I entrusted you with a secret. You keep that secret in your heart. You have no right to go and publicize this secret to anyone unless you seek my permission. And a lot of the times that happens where people start publicizing other people's secrets because they had a fallout. I'm going to take him down. I'm going to destroy his life. He told me this and she told me that. And they said this to us and they said that to us. And start going around and exposing people's secrets and publicize their secrets. Haram, haram, haram. It is evil, evil, evil. And one of the worst actions in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَوْفُوا بِالْعَهْدِ إِنَّ الْعَهْدَ كَانَ مَسْؤُولًا As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention in the Qur'an al-Kareem. Fulfill your obligations. Fulfill your vows. Fulfill your promises. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you over your vow and promise. Allah is going to ask you about it. Subhanallah. I'm not going to read the entire story here, but the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's been narrated here by Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that when Hafsa, the daughter of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an, when her husband passed away, and he was one of the believing men, he passed away in one of the battlefields or before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got married to her. So Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu was seeking a good husband for his daughter. So he went to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and told him, are you interested in my daughter? Like he's trying to find a good person for his daughter. And subhanAllah, that's also a trait, a quality of a keen father, a religious father that's looking for the best person for his daughter. So he went to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and proposed his daughter to Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr didn't say anything. Then he went to Uthman bin Affan. Uthman said, I'm not in a position that I want to get married. Then later on, he went to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam complaining to him about offering and proposing his daughter to Abu Bakr and Uthman and both of them not responding back to Umar ibn Khattab. So the Prophet Muhammad SAW said to him, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send your daughter someone better. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Hafsa, the daughter of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anha, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After the Prophet Muhammad SAW got engaged and married to Hafsa, Abu Bakr went to Umar ibn Khattab. He said, look, I just want to talk to you. I just want to clear things up. Don't have anything in your heart towards me when you ask me and you propose your daughter to me that I did not say yes. The only reason I didn't say yes is because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had shown interest in your daughter and I knew of that, so I didn't want to step on the toes of the Prophet Muhammad So the purpose, and what we learn out of this hadith, that Abu Bakr عنه, knew of something that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has shared with him and Abu Bakr did not even disclose that even to Umar ibn Khattab عنه, which is in the best interest of Umar ibn Khattab. But it's a secret at the end of the day, even if it's in the best interest. Even if it's something good. So not necessarily that uh, I'm not, I'm not going to expose a bad secret. But if it's a good secret, if, if it's a good secret, I'm going to expose it. No, you're wrong. A secret is a secret. Whether it's a good thing or bad thing. If someone comes up to you and tells you, look, Alhamdulillah, I just made a million bucks. That's a good thing. Alhamdulillah, mabrook. But akhi, don't tell anyone. It doesn't mean you can't tell the entire world. Oh, but you know, there's nothing wrong with it. I don't mind that. I wouldn't mind people knowing that I've got a million bucks. But this guy minds it. It's not wallahi what you think of it. If someone had entrusted you with a secret, whether it's a good secret or a bad secret, whether it's a positive thing, negative thing, an advantage or disadvantage, at the end of that, it's a secret. And you have to respect that secret. You have to respect that secret. Never publicize it. And then measure it upon yourself and analyze it upon yourself and say, oh, okay, it's not going to harm me. 
I'll be happy if people know this about me. If someone had entrusted you with something, you just have to respect that. And subhanAllah, it just reflects upon the respect of the secrets of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala had to one another. Uh, another one here is during the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when he was on his deathbed. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was uh, being nursed by his wife Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha in her chamber, in her room, in her house. So when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was dying and he was on his deathbed, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa stayed in the house of Aisha where the rest of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa will come and visit the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in the house of Aisha, including his daughter Fatima. So one day while the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was on his deathbed, Fatima walks into the house of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa asks her to come near him. And then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whispered in her ear. The first time the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whispered in the ear of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, she started to weep and cry. Then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whispered in the ear of Fatima the second time. And Fatima had a big smile on her face. And who's watching? The wives of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, including Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, the owner of the house or the wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that's living and residing in that house. When Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha left the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Aisha chased her and asked her, you know, please tell us what, what happened there. The first time he cried, the second time he smiled after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whispered the new ear, please share it with us. Fatima said, no, that's not going to happen. Until the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away. Aisha, she was young. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, she was 18 years old. So she had a sharp memory. She didn't forget. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa passed away, she approached Fatima radiallahu ta'ala and asked Fatima, please disclose and tell us what did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whisper in your ear? Share it with us. So she said, after my father sallallahu alayhi wa had passed away, now I'm willing to share what my father had told me. The first time my father whispered in my ear and I cried, he told me that usually Jibreel alayhi salam revises the Quran Kareem with him once every year. But this year he revised it twice as an indication of the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She understood it, she picked it up, which means, oh daughter, I'm about to die. And that's why she cried. Obviously she's gonna cry. We're hearing the story, we're about to cry. The second time, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whispered in her ear, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Fatima, you'll be the first member of my family that will die after me. So she smiled. She's smiling because of her death. Subhanallah, imagine, you know, your father tells you, look, you're going to die very soon after me. Like, please, Mishan, Allah, hil anni. Like, ruh, anta, die, hil anni. But Subhanallah, you're talking about that connection to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where she smiled, she was happy, and overwhelmed to know that she's going to die straight after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in which she did. She died six months after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The lesson that we learn out of this story is Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha kept the, uh, the secret of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not disclose it to anyone including to the wives of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even though she had a good relationship with him and you're talking about Aisha Fatima doesn't have any doubt in the honesty and the trustworthiness of Aisha to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so my brothers and my sisters it's so important for us to respect the secrets of others if someone entrusts us of a secret, then we must respect that. If you are the type of person that knows himself, you know what, I'm not the type of person that knows, or I'm not the type of person that believes in himself or has that confidence that I can safeguard secrets of other people. If you are the type of person, then please tell people that from the very beginning. If someone's about to tell you a secret, then please, 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 brother, don't tell me that. I'm the type of person that can't safeguard secrets. And I've experienced it before, you know, I wanted to test someone before, he said, please, say, don't tell me. If it's about not telling anyone, sometimes my tongue let, lets loose. I can't control it. I'm not the type of person that can safeguard and protect secrets. If you're the type of person, no problems. You're better off telling someone, look, don't tell me your secrets, better than you listening to the secret of someone, then later on you are publicizing this and disclosing that to other people. That's a lot worse. If it's about integrity, it's about dignity, then you have more integrity when you tell someone, look, don't tell me your secrets because I'm not interested in your secret. And at the same time, I can't guarantee you that I'm not going to publicize this to other people. You have more integrity in that than you are the type of person that listens to other people's secrets and then later on you publicize to other people. And regardless, once again, regardless, my brothers and my sisters, whether that secret 
that's been disclosed to you from someone that you get along with or you don't get along with. Whether someone you like or don't like. Inshallah, he is the worst of people on the face of this earth. If he is your worst enemy, if this person discloses a secret to you, then you have to safeguard that secret. You have no rights for you to go and publicize it or disclose it to other people. Even if it's the worst of people. Even if it's the worst of people. So fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and know that Allah is watching. Inna al-ahda kana mas'ula. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask you over the secrets. And subhanallah, it's an epidemic. A disease. Sickness. Amongst people where we listen to other people's secrets and later on we're going to disclose it to other people. Just because we hate them. We just want to put them down. We just want to put this person down. Oh no, his secret. He told me this. Oh, you know what? I found out something about him. And after you found out something about this person, you want to disclose him. You want to tell the entire world about this person. Fi Allah. Allah's watching. You might benefit in this world. You might get rid of an enemy that you wanted to get rid of. But at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching. The benefit that you're going to get in this dunya is by far nowhere near the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you will be punished in the hereafter. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst those who listen in here and act upon what they listen in here. Subhanak Allah, muhammadik, nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ulaik. Person's destiny. Shall I in Jenna, 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 Jenna?